Before I read the scripture, may I point out that as you read the Bible, you become increasingly aware that God has made use of every possible means of communicating his eternal truth to men and women. He has laid hold upon every kind of thing that, with which men are familiar. He doesn't hesitate to sweep his hand across the heavens and make an analogy to the stars, the sun, the moon, the clouds, the blue of the sky. He ransacks the animal kingdom and draws into the orbit of his descriptive genius every animal, every bird, goes into the kingdom of the flowers and uses the flowers into the mineral kingdom, the mountains, the rivers, the seas, the pathways. Everything is used if by any means he may impart to us and communicate some much needed truth for the maturation of our true destiny as the sons of God. Some of these metaphors and analogies are not too flattering. They're not intended to be. They're designed to shame us. They're designed to see us in our degradation and in our self-denigration and in our failure to rise to our high destiny. And they irk us and urge us, coerce and pressure us to better things. And when he speaks about the birds of the air, he speaks of the sparrow, he speaks of the raven, he speaks of the vulture, he speaks of the eagle, he speaks of other birds, and all of them are analogies or metaphors or are designed to teach us a lesson. And God has woven into the warp and woof of the whole creation. His purposes, until his name is writ large, like a signature across the things that are made. And the Apostle Paul gives us that majestic summary in Romans 1.20 when he tells us that God's eternal power and Godhead are to be seen in the things that are made. You see God's signature in the delicate petal of a flower written in the finest of characters. You see it like some great flourishing identification mark across the sweep of the starry heavens. Everywhere you look, once you've been alerted to the existence of God, you find him everywhere. He's written in your own conscience. You find him in the face of your child. You find him in the plaintive cry of an animal. You find him in the craggy heights of a mountain range. God is everywhere. And once your sense is are regenerated and stirred, and you start to move into your God-likeness. You start to mature into your true destiny as a human being the way God intended you to be, redeemed and made like unto Christ. Every part of the created universe becomes yours, and you possess it, and it speaks to you, and it describes something that you need to know. And so God uses the eagle. Uh, it raises the old question of which came first, the hen or the egg. But undoubtedly, the creature came first, and when God made the creature, he made the creature to be more than a creature. He made the creature to be a lesson. He made the creature to be a projection of some aspect of eternal cosmic truth. And so as we consider the eagle tonight, we're not just having a nature study, we are looking at one of the I's that he's dotted or the T's that he has crossed in the literature of nature. He's telling us something. He wants us to know it. This isn't just a novelty. This is a lesson. This is a revelation. The eagle speaks to us because he came from the hand of a God whose passion is to talk and speak and communicate with his creatures. And so we're reading from Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 28, hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator, notice the character in which he's presented here, the Creator of the ends of the earth, 
fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Assuming that we all agree on the Mosaic authorship of the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch, it is undoubtedly true that Moses, as he spent time shepherding his father-in-law's flock, saw the thing that he speaks about in Deuteronomy 32.11, probably saw it again and again until each time he saw it, he watched with amazement because each time it was equally a miraculous indication of the nature of God. And Moses was alert to all the signs of the Almighty incorporated into the creation. And so in 32.11 of Deuteronomy, and I'm quoting the Berkeley version, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovering over its young, spreading its wings to catch them and bear them on its pinions, so God. Now I want to talk first about the training of the eagle. In the country where the Bible finds its setting, there were two kinds of eagles. One was the imperial eagle and the other the golden eagle. Both of them immediately, if you have a mind for the Bible at all, will speak to you of their symbolic intent. For when I speak of gold, I'm speaking of God. When I speak of imperial, I'm speaking of kingship. And remember that the eagle is the type of the Christian ideally considered. There are other birds we may have reference to as we go along that are not too flattering in their natural connotations, spiritually considered. But the eagle is the king of birds, this mag majestic bird with its great wings spread and its sovereignly, kingly, imperial demeanor as it rules the heavens. So it is only fitting that these two titles should be attached to this majestic bird. He's an imperial eagle, and we too are imperial eagles. For the Bible says, he hath made us kings and priests. What's more, Paul says in Romans 5.17, we reign in life by one Christ Jesus. I've got to chain myself at this point or I'll, I'll go away off on a digression and harangue you again and berate you for being less than God intended you to be. Too long have we Christians thought that we were supposed to be self-effacing, withdrawn milk toasts. We were not supposed to assert the glory of God. We were not supposed to walk with our heads high. We were not supposed to be what we're supposed to be. Kings reigning with him even now in life. Masters of our passions and our appetites. Masters of sin. Masters of satanic, insidious attempt to invade our territory, beating them off with royal flourishes, not condescending to scuffle with them in the dust, but bidding them to be gone in the name of Jesus, rising to walk with dignity as those who are kings and reign in life by one Christ Jesus. The other name of the Palestinian eagle was the golden eagle. And gold speaks of God. <coughs> and Peter tells us that we as Christians <coughs> are partakers of the divine nature. This again is another great area of need. For so long we have mistaken humility or weakness for humility and self-effacing withdrawal as modesty and meekness when all the time it's been a cop-out. We've not wanted to face up to our duty as the representatives of God in the earth. 